Hi all, thank you for joining us today. Uh, before I hand it off to Bob Gunn with Synergy, I wanted to give a little introduction. This is gonna be the first of two webinars, this one being the Grow Lamp Rebates Overview. Our next webinar will be May 29th. We'll go into more detail of, about the next webinar at the end of this presentation. There will be a Q&A at the end, but feel free to type your questions into the Q&A bubble at any time during the webinar, and we will get through all that we can once the presentation concludes. Uh, we will be recording this webinar and uploading to our YouTube channel and sharing with all you as well as others to view on demand. Um, now, I'll kind of hand it off to Bob Gunn, a partner of BIOS and our in-house rebate expert. Bob, go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much, Patrick. Thank you everyone for joining us this Friday afternoon. Uh, so glad to see so many familiar names calling in. Um, yeah, BIOS and Synergy has had a, a great partnership for a couple of years now. <clears throat> what we offer is uh, in-house rebate expertise to support BIOS' sales staff with their commercial operations. Um, Energy is a consulting firm rooted in energy and utilities practice. I founded the company seven years ago after working for five years for an electric utility here in Washington State. Um, since then, but before horticulture lighting became a big thing, what Synergy has always been doing is trying to bridge the gap between utilities, what they're trying to accomplish with their energy efficiency budgets and goals, and the market. Um, there's a lot of messaging and connecting and project management that, that has to happen. That's Synergy's core competency, and that's what we bring to the BIOS team. Uh, our goal is to contribute to customer success, and what that looks like for us is when a customer successfully gets an incentive from a utility program, and that incentive uh, goes back towards other operations and helps them invest in premium efficiency equipment that's gonna save them money over the long term, but really helps with that upfront incremental cost associated with higher cost LEDs. Synergy offers, through the, the BIOS team, estimates, uh, scenario planning, we help optimize rebates, and we help educate about how the utility world works with regard to this kind of complex transaction that a customer might only go through once in their life. Uh, we do all of that for free to customers. Uh, we, we create a roadmap to say, here's what you might be able to get at the end of this roadmap. And it's, it's site specific, it's project specific, it's utility specific. And here's what you need to keep in mind as you, as you embark on this journey. Some customers, however, prefer a chauffeur. They want someone to do it for them. And for those customers, we offer uh, kind of a premium service. It's, a, it's for, a, for a small fee that bio subsidizes two thirds of the cost of this fee. Um, we will do everything for you. Like hiring a real estate agent, we will list it, we will do all the application, fill out the paperwork, let you know what to sign and where, identify you to the risks of the process and what, make sure you understand what you're signing, that contract between you and the utility. We'll do everything and, and we won't uh, leave until we make sure you have that check in your hand from the utility. Um, there, there's a small fee that's scaled associated with the rebate. And again, if, if we don't get anything, there's no cost. And what cost there is is subsidized by BIOS by two thirds. Synergy day in and day out maintains our database of over 2000 utilities and all the different program rules and regulations, which are changing all the time without warning. Um, and we don't publish that database, but it's available for, our, for BIOS, our program partner here, so that they can give their customers most up-to-date uh, accurate information possible. Uh, along with that, one of the tools that we've built for them is web access directly to the back end of our database so that with a zip code or a city name, a location identifier, they can quickly uh, triage rebate opportunities to see who the utility is, confirm that with the customer, whether it's on a trade show floor or on the telephone, um, and identify what might be available and any, you know, any qualitative uh, project identifiers that they might want to bring up early on. Um, so those are some of the tools. That's the partnership between BIOS and Synergy. Uh, and you know, we're, we're, we're hopeful to help you, many of you customers on the line to, to achieve success with these projects. Now we'll dive in a little bit into the who, what, where, and why, and how of electric utilities. Uh, so this is what I'll, I'll, I'll go through. I have eight, eight slides. Some of them are pretty quick. Uh, and I'll plan to talk for about 20 minutes or so. And then um, we have Q&A and Patrick's gonna be monitoring that. And we'll open this up for discussion after about a, a half hour into the call. So we'll start with, you know, what are rebates? Who offers them? What types are available? 
Um, what is the rebate potential? <clears throat> How big could it be? What type of operation is eligible? Why are incentives paid? And what matters sometimes and what matters always? For starters, what are rebates? Um, rebates and incentives, I use the word terms synonymously in this context. There are cash incentives or cash grant from your electric utility to you, the customer of the utility. It's directly tied to the energy efficiency project that we propose to the utility before you start that project. Um, all customer, uh, I don't, most customers are eligible for these programs unless you have previously opted out of the energy efficiency tariff, um, but that's a rare thing. Uh, for most cases, customers are eligible and entitled to these funds, but it is by no means automatic. It requires a pretty uh, thorough application process. And I will mention this over uh, several times in this presentation, pre-approval, I can't make a big enough stink about it. It matters a lot. But at the end of the day, this is, an, uh, this is a grant from your electric utility in the form of a check, sometimes a, a credit on your bill, but usually a check that comes in the mail to you, the customer. Who offers it? It's the electric utility. Um, get, there are gas programs as well, but then it would be the gas utility. But what I mean by this is this is not a city uh, economic development incentive. It's not a county program. It's not a state incentive like you might associate with electric vehicles, something like that. And it's not a federal incentive that you might uh, have learned about educating yourself about solar that might be a 30% tax credit for a solar project or accelerated depreciation or 179D, which would be a, a tax credit for energy efficiency improvements to buildings. Those things I just mentioned are federal programs from the IRS. Not to say that some of those might not be available for energy efficiency things, um, but we're here talking about electric utility programs. Electric, and, and you can you know, take advantage of all of these things if they're available, but electric utility programs are from your electric utility with your utility's money. It's rate payer money, meaning you pay into the programs. It's usually a line item on your bill, about uh, one-tenth of one percent typically. You pay into this bucket of money, and if you have an eligible project and you apply correctly, you can benefit directly from that bucket of money. Why do utilities offer these incentives? They do sound too good to be true, but they are true. In a nutshell, utilities invest in energy efficiency and conservation because it's the lowest cost resource. As loads grow, and as utilities have a requirement to meet that load growth, and that could be through population growth and because people and businesses use more energy than we used to. So loads are growing, say, 1% to 4% per year. Uh, utilities have two choices. Build new resources or buy new resources. I guess that's one. Build it or, or invest in the customer side, the demand side of the equation, which would be bring that curve down. So despite 4% population growth, maybe the demands are flat because utilities have invested on the customer side of the equation to, to lower the, the energy use per customer. Um, we have a regulatory framework in most parts of this country for, for most utilities that allows utilities <clears throat> to treat their investments in energy efficiency on equal footing as their investments in a new power plant. Because a lot of utilities do own power plants, they're profitable. They can still spend a million dollars on energy efficiency and make the same rate of return and depreciate it like they would a hard asset. And that, that structure's been around for ages, but that really helps utilities uh, from an accounting standpoint, justify this. There's also other motivators for utilities to invest in energy efficiency. Some of them might be state mandates. You've heard of renewable portfolio standards that might sound like 20% renewables by 2030. Oftentimes in those renewable portfolio standards, they'll have a conservation standard. It's usually smaller. Uh, it's like a footnote. They'll say, and you must pursue all cost-effective conservation that gives them the blessing or maybe more even the, of a mandate of their state uh, or a voter initiative to say, we need you guys to invest in this stuff too. It's a, it's a clean energy initiative. We want you to invest in, in cleaning up what we have, reducing the impact on the grid uh, in order to accommodate you know, load growth with, with it, smaller impacts. Uh, and lastly, influencing technology choice and market transformation. 
utilities with their incentive dollars are only incentivizing the most efficient technologies, the ones that will use less per unit of output, in our case, uh, you know, fewer watts per micromole produced, because they can uh, accommodate what that grower, in our case, what a grower is trying to do with fewer watts. They're only gonna invest in the efficient technologies because they're new technologies and because they're more expensive than the incumbent legacy technology. Once that market transformation or once market traction increases, say over a period of three to five years, if properly measured, utilities might say, well, now we're, instead of 5% LED penetration, we're at 50% penetration, maybe we don't need to offer incentives anymore. Or energy codes uh, will come along and say, it seems like the cost has come down over this period of incentivizing this new technology. Now we're just gonna make that required or industry standard practice. And we are seeing that happening specifically in California. It's called Title 24. It's their building energy code, which to date does not cover industrial processes in general and specifically horticulture lighting has been exempt. It's not really lighting per se, it's really just a manufacturing process that emits light as well. Um, but they are you know, um, investigating, regulating this, which might be good for locking in energy savings, but if they do it too soon, it will uh, undermine the utility incentives that are currently available to growers in California. So there, it gives me a little heartburn to think of that happening too quickly. Um, you know, if someone's buying a million dollars worth of lights instead of $200,000 worth of cheaper lights, you know, that $800,000 incremental cost is significant. But when the utility says, I'll contribute 200 or 300,000 towards that, that gets us closer to closing that gap. Um, any, in any case, the point there is that Utility incentives help with things when the technology is expensive in order to invest in that technology, be, may, bring the cost down, make it more affordable to a point where those incentives at some future point will no longer be required to get the same effect. So enough about that. That's some of the reasons why utility incentives are available. Now, what type of incentives are available? For 99% of the applications here for grow lights, these are custom grant applications. With any custom commercial grant application at a utility, pre-approval is the name of the game. Uh, the utilities might say we offer so many cents per kilowatt hour or per kilowatt reduced, uh, up to a certain cost cap, up to a percentage of the costs of the eligible costs. Um, but you have to document all that in lots of detail before buying anything. By contrast, the there's a handful of more mature programs that you might have encountered if you bought an Energy Star appliance at a Home Depot and there's a $50 off instant coupon, that would be a point of sale or instant markdown uh, opportunity. Or maybe you bought uh, a Samsung or an LG TV from bestbuy.com and there's, a, you know, this, this, that brand is subsidized. Well, that might be because maybe the utilities or a consortium of utilities worked with Samsung or LG to say, it's more cost effective for us to give you $20 per efficient TV to put that market, to put that item on the shelf instead of less efficient ones. It's more cost effective to do that type of program than to have a thousand different utilities try to uh, chase a paper trail down to a million different customers. So those upstream, and we call that upstream in the supply chain, uh, mid or upstream programs don't yet exist for custom horticulture. They exist for generally smaller ticket items, appliances, light bulbs, of course, uh, when I say light bulbs, uh, commercial light bulbs, where you buy a five pack that says this is $3 instead of $15, thanks to utility program. On the back end, they're doing an, an upstream or a midstream program, uh, or even a manufacturer buy down. When the manufacturers are dealing with the utility administrators to get the incentive and make those products more available to the customer. Mail and rebates are similar. Tax credits I mentioned are generally a, a federal thing or a state thing uh, that's, that has nothing to do with utilities, really. These are custom grants, you pre-apply, there's a check written to you, and the checks can be pretty rewarding. The rebate potential for these projects can be huge. Uh, generally, a 10 to 50% off of the invoice price is what we experience. Uh, each utility will have its own uh, total project cap 
that might be a $20,000 cap for a small utility. It might be a $2 million per year cap for another utility. The slide says a million dollars per customer. The idea there is to indicate um, these caps are usually, we usually don't hit the total cost cap for these projects. They're quite generous. Uh, there's a three to five year uh, window of opportunity because as I described with market transformation, eventually high efficiency lighting, what's super high efficient today might become industry standard practice when more people adopt the technology. And with that, we would expect a decrease in cost like we saw happen with solar or ductless heat pumps or uh, you know CFLs, if you go back 12 years or so ago, they became standard practice and the cost came down so much that the incentives were no longer available. So right now the getting's good. Uh, it's, now's the time to apply for these incentives. They should still be around a year from now, just as healthy, healthy as they are. But three years from now, we're already seeing California, you know, incentives are looking dire uh, starting 2023. Um, so, so get it while we can. Uh, and, and the market has a lot of availability of these incentives. If you Google cannabis incentives for your particular utility, chances are you won't find what you're looking for. Even if you Google that utility name and dig in their website, you probably won't find information specific to what you can get for your program. There's a couple notable exceptions of utilities that do have a half page or even maybe a couple case studies about projects they've done with cannabis growers. Many of these utilities who do offer incentives to cannabis growers and others, this is not all about cannabis, they, they won't advertise it, but it's available. Again, that's why it's a custom project. Um, and, and oftentimes we've had customers come to us. Gosh, I've had this happen several times. A customer will come to me and say, well, I called my utility such and such, and they said, there's no lighting incentive for horticulture, or it has to, my light has to be on this certain list. And since it's not, uh, I'm not eligible. And the first question I ask is, did you ask them about lighting or did you ask them about a custom commercial incentive program? And they'll generally say lighting. I say, well, this isn't lighting. This is an industrial a manufacturing process. You're manufacturing a plant. This is a custom industrial or commercial avenue we need to go down. So it's a different program manager, it's a different set of rules and regulations. It's also a different budget. So all this to say that, uh, you know, working with, you know, Synergy and BIOS, we, we'll get you the right answers for your project and uh, ch chances are better than, than not that even, if, if your utility offers incentives, chances are good. We can get an incentive for grow lights. Eligible operations. Um, most, most commercial uh, projects are eligible, um, both if they're an existing, so if you're removing old HPS lights and putting in LEDs, that's a pretty straightforward upgrade, but also new construction um, is available, or new canopy. If you're expanding from a 1,000 square foot room to a 5,000 square foot room, that's okay that you didn't have lights before. We can still demonstrate uh, with, you know, with some reasonable cause how much the energy would have been under an HPS scenario and how much it will be under uh, the LED scenario. There's no real energy code to measure it against, so they use industry standard practice, but that's okay. That's, that's standard practice for us in the energy community to say, here's what we might otherwise do. Here's what we could have done, um, but here's what we're gonna save as a result. That's what the utility is interested in. How much is gonna be saved compared to what you might have otherwise done or what you would have otherwise done. And we'll get into the, that subtlety in a moment. Uh, greenhouses are eligible as well. The big thing there is that they generally get smaller incentives than indoors and it's counterintuitive because greenhouses have less energy intensity, but because the hours of operation are lower, the energy savings, which is based on the kilowatts times hours, is smaller. So greenhouses tend to get about half of the incentive potential as indoor grows. But again, it depends on the utilities. Some utilities pay based on kilowatt hours saved, some just based on the kilowatts because they really are a peak demand driven or peaks are their, are their pain points. So they, they just care about the, the total bandwidth reduced uh, regardless of how many hours it operates. But yeah, greenhouses, indoor, all eligible, vertical grow, hydroponics, it's all good. Um, even if there's no program available that's published, um, through the custom track, we can almost always get these things approved. 
thought it's okay here we go what all, what always matters so we have what always matters and what sometimes matters and this is you know we're probably three quarters of the way through the presentation um location 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 who your utility is matters a lot and for better or worse you can't you really pick your utility some utilities have excellent programs uh, but if you're on the wrong side of the street and you're served by this other utility uh, that just maybe doesn't have an incentive program or because of the makeup that, of that utility they're not comfortable or willing to work with a cannabis operation uh, if they don't have those funds available for your grow you're just out of luck in most cases um, the prime example is in Oregon. The Energy Trust of Oregon services much of the state. Uh, they have awesome programs, really good intake processes. Uh, staff is super knowledgeable and quick to approve things. And they've done, you know, I don't know, probably 50 or 100 projects. So that's great if you're an Energy Trust of Oregon customer, but if you're on the wrong side of the street in Corvallis or in Bend or one of these places where utility service territories butt up against each other, you're just out of luck. Um, and with incentives so that's that's an unfortunate reality but oftentimes when we first start talking to a prospective grower we ask them the location and and you know we might get a zip code or a city or state but some places like phoenix i mean uh, i don't know if you, i don't know if my video is working but the service territories are like overlapping fingers so it really matters if you're arizona public service or salt river project those two different utilities will have uh, differing incentives. Luckily, they both offer incentives, but in any case, we need to know the location of the facility, not just where the owner of the facility lives, but where the facility will be. Uh, Pre-approval, again, this is the biggest thing that almost always matters. I've had one project out of the last 80 grow lamp projects that did not require pre-approval, um, but pre-approval is just the name of the game. You really need to allow, I say, six to eight weeks to get approval. Usually, the first couple weeks are us getting lighting layouts and figuring out the, the pricing and things like that, and then getting our ducks in a row. And then about four weeks as standard for utilities to approve these projects. After that is when we get this utility approval. They'll have different names, maybe notice to proceed, maybe an engagement contract, but that's a formal, usually a formal communication from the utility saying, now you can go buy your lights. And that's when money is exchanged, lights are installed, et cetera. Um, failure to do that is is the biggest landmine that we might step in and it can be heartbreaking for some to step in that landmine uh, i do have a couple stories about that the rebate influence on purchase decision is also kind of a a strange one um, and it's, it's most prevalent in well in california but a lot of other places the the policy underpinning behind rebate influence is that Utilities, well, the evaluators and the regulators and, and, and the people you know, making budgets for these efficiency programs want to ensure that the dollars being spent are helping the market, helping a customer invest in something that they wouldn't have otherwise invested in. Um, if, I mean, if we approach the utility saying, I'm buying half a million dollars of these LEDs, I want an incentive. And they ask us, well, what would you have purchased if we didn't offer you this incentive to me it's a, it's kind of a trick question because you want to tell you want to demonstrate to them that you're committed to energy efficiency and all this so you might say well i'm going to i'm going to figure out a way to buy these with you know but the incentive would be nice it sounds like the right answer but actually it could disqualify you and they might label you as a free rider which means if you're going to do it without us, great. We'll save that the incentive, maybe two hundred thousand dollars incentive, and give it to someone else who wouldn't do it otherwise. So, it's it's. I think it's kind of a silly trick question, where the proper answer is to say, well, you know, without your incentive, I'm going to get the cheapest thing available on the market. And it is a hypothetical question, and we have to only answer it hypothetically, uh, which is say, this is what I could go buy or I might go buy. Um, if you're retrofitting and you have existing lights, that's easy. You say, these are the lights I'm using today, and maybe you know, I'm gonna expand my facility and use these lights, that, that's nice. But if it's a, a brand new facility, if you bought an old Kroger and you're turning it into a cannabis facility, um, they might, it, it's, it's a clean slate. So utilities generally look for baselines. And the baseline 
I guess that's two bullets down there, is uh, either what's existing, an existing condition, it's uh, energy code, which like I mentioned, doesn't exist anywhere yet for horticulture lighting, or it's industry standard practice, ISP. And that's a very subjective thing. And how, the, how you answer that question about what you would have installed um, or how the utility, you know, sometimes they push their own baseline on us, that has a material difference in the incentives that are available. Um, yeah, because you're comparing the energy savings of your LED versus a moderately efficient light or a very inefficient light or the worst possible efficiency. Like the difference is how much savings is there, which almost always co directly correlates to the, the dollar amount that we can get from the utility. So we need credible documentation for this. That's a must. But also that baseline is so squishy um, that uh, you know, paying attention to that and understanding how it affects the incentive is is a big reason you know, why, frankly, we work with, you know, you would work closely with your lighting vendor and maybe uh, if some sort of, someone who's done some energy management and then can uh, get into the analysis with utility on these things. What always matters, I say project size over $30,000. This is really a qualifying question. Small projects won't merit the utilities engineering time or our, our time to, to work on this. So we say over $30,000. I have come across a lot of utilities who do have project minimums and they'll say if the incentive is less than $10,000, we just can't do custom project for it. If we fast forward two or three years to a point where we have more prescriptive programs, like I mentioned earlier, maybe it's at the register buy down or a manufacturer buy down or a mail in rebate, then, then smaller projects will be able to be accommodated. There's some, there are some pilots going on like that with residential customers in, in Oregon, for example. Um, but generally, if the project's less than $30,000, it's hard to justify the, cu the custom route. The timeline matters a lot uh, with incentives. Of course, like I mentioned, pre-approval takes time, uh, but the order of operations is, is critical. Uh, I'll, sh I'll share um, the first <laughs> horror story I have, because I'm almost done with my slides here is I recently, a customer approached me, I forget how they found me, because uh, they had worked with their utility in California starting back in December. They applied for a whole bunch of incentive, a large incentive project. And they got, a, and this wasn't a bios job, because this wouldn't have happened if it was a bios job, I'll tell you that. Um, they, they, got, they started their process with the utility, the utility came out, they had a back and forth, you know, healthy relationship with their utility for over the course of about eight weeks. And the customer, for whatever reason, switched lighting vendors, bought something else. Their new lighting vendor said, yeah, our fixtures are, are qualified for incentive programs. They're on what we call the DLC list, which I'll mention next, on the next slide. And the customer said, great, these are qualified. We went ahead and bought the lights. Another six weeks go by, and this utility was not quick to approve this project. And finally, they said, okay, here's your approval. And the customer said, oh, the lights are already installed and running. And and the utility heard that, uh, it, the deal was off. They said, oh, that $190,000, that this piece of letter we just just delivered to you is no, you're no longer eligible for that. You bought the lights before you had approval. And the customer was frustrated and highly disappointed as they should be. So they said, well, I thought we were okay. We did this, we talked about it. And the utility said, yeah, but we didn't, we had to go through our approval process. It got audited and reg, you know, by the regulators or the random audit and you weren't approved to buy those lights. So that customer got zero dollars. They're frustrated with everyone who supported them along the way. You know, you know that other vendor who said, yeah, we're qualified. So the, qual the fixtures were qualified, but your project was not yet qualified. That was a disappointing result. Our goal with, with BIOS and Synergy Partnership is to make sure that never happens to one of our customers. Um, so make, we make sure we get that piece of paper. Uh, and you know, it's even if it means, you know, Triple checking. Hey, hey, utility, are we ready to go? Yes, you're ready to go. Then you buy the lights, install them, et cetera. Process matters a lot in these things. And that goes with that last bullet point, that patience pays off. Uh, the approvals don't happen overnight, but uh, it's, it's really worth it to get these incentives from the utility. And there's some other things that sometimes matter. This is my last slide. Um, is fixture specifications. Uh, utilities have different program qualifications, and you might hear terms like DLC listing, that's Design Lights Consortium. That's kind of like the Energy Star label for lighting. 
for standard lighting and there's a list for horticulture lighting. It's relatively new. Um, some utilities require it. Uh, most utilities don't yet require it because it is still a new specification, but they might refer to it. Uh, or they might say, we'd like you to meet a certain specification level, but you don't have to be on that list yet because we understand um, there's other growing pains or, or barriers to becoming on that list. Um, and or UL listing, that's a safety standard to make sure your fixtures aren't going to catch on fire. It's, you know, any, you should always have products that are UL or tested to UL standards just for not burning your building down. But there might be some other uh, requirements for the program warranty or program or fixture efficacy. Um, those are some minimum uh, requirements. And, and again, 2,000 utilities in North America, they're all trying to figure it out as well. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of redundancy in the efforts, um, if, especially for places that haven't had a lot of indoor grows, but maybe now with hemp coming online or a state like Missouri all of a sudden has 40 some cultivation licenses for cannabis coming online, largely indoors. They've never dealt with this before, so they're calling their utility peers and figuring out how it's going to happen, what pro, how should they design their program, and, uh, and all that stuff. So each utility might do it slightly different. There's going to be a lot of similarities, but, but everyone matters. Um, what you did in one utility in one state won't necessarily carry over. Um, cost caps are, are a thing I mentioned up to a million dollars per project. You know, there's going to be an up to amount for several utilities. It's more common that we'll see up to $150,000. But if you're looking at a big project, uh, it, and the utility says, well, sorry, we, can't, we have no flexibility. We can only give you $150,000 per year. It might make sense to take that project and phase it in over time, which is what I see with a lot of grows anyways who are building out, to do half of it you know, by December of this year and the other half starting in January of next year. So now maybe you can get $300,000 for that same scope of work if you just phase it out a little bit. Um, that's, a, that's a strategy. Uh, oftentimes, just working with your utility and negotiating, seeing if they have latitude or not, um, you'd be surprised at how uh, how successful you can be. Just figuring out where where the where the rules and regs fall and, and what's possible. So, timing of use sometimes matters. Some utilities just pay for energy regardless of when it's saved. We kind of see that in the Northwest. Other utilities that have a lot of you know, that are peaking utilities, maybe down in the South. There's lots of air conditioning. They really care about those peaks or summer peaks specifically. So if you save energy on a hot summer day, we'll give you a big incentive. But if you're, if you're in a greenhouse and they only care about hot summer days, well, unfortunately for that utility, um, you might get nothing because on a hot summer day in a greenhouse, your lights wouldn't be on anyways. So what, regardless of what type of light it was, it won't matter. So that's a real counterintuitive one. Uh, so timing of day, timing of when the energy is used and saved sometimes matters, sometimes doesn't. Hours of operation, same thing. Sometimes matters. It usually matters. Uh, it usually doesn't. Technology matters. Um, you know, what you're installing, they care a lot about that. Most incentive programs going towards LEDs only, um, which is, you know, may, maybe it seems obvious, but to me it seems like natural that that's where we'd be incentivizing the market to go. Um, price also so sometimes matters. Uh, sometimes utilities will offer so many cents per kilowatt hour up to a you'll hear up to 50% of the incremental cost. Sometimes you're at that cost cap. And if you are, it's worth taking a moment in your analysis to say, well, what other costs are eligible for this project? You know, it, can I include the cost of the plugs and the freight? Well, maybe that sounds reasonable. If it's a retrofit, can I include the cost to dispose of my old lights? Yes. Uh, and so you can increase the cost, which is gonna increase your incentive. But sometimes you're not at that cost cap, so the cost of the fixture doesn't really matter. Um, it's kind of a, I don't know if that principle is coming across, but uh, cost sometimes matters. And again, when we, when we say you're getting a 25% incentive, we're not figuring that out by looking at the incentive and or the, the invoice and just dividing by four, uh, that's the output of the equation. We're saying this energy, energy savings, what the utility is willing to pay, equates to 25% of that incentive. If that fixture cost comes down, well now, now it's 30% of that, of that in invoice. Um, yeah. 
And, and lastly, crop sometimes matters. It does matter to the extent that it affects the hours of operation. You know, what's the daily light integral that that crop is looking for? But that, that, that sometimes matters. I mean, from a policy standpoint, unfortunately, there's still places that won't play nice with cannabis. Um, usually that's because they are tied to the federal government in one way or another, or there's just some politics involved. Um, you know, you can call me offline and ask me for my for my my dirty list, but of utilities who do, who don't offer incentives to cannabis growers. But uh, you know, the crack in the in the door that I like seeing is that hemp is now around, and and some growers have even been switching their business models to hemp in order to get incentives. And I think they're happy going that route because there's also fewer barriers. But uh, that's maybe a conversation for a different day. Crop does matter. Um, to the extent that utilities want to make sure, you know, hey, you're installing a lot of uh, lighting intensity, high PPFD. Is that really for microgreens? But they understand that what's going on and say, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I shared that one. I'm kind of getting to the end of what I what I was planning to share with you. Um, I don't know what's happening in the Q&A. I haven't looked yet. Um, Patrick can cut me off. You know, I, I yeah. guess. Yeah, I think. I think if you're ready, we can, we have one question on board and I, I, you know, encourage everyone else if you have any interim now, so we can, we can uh, have Bob's time here and he can walk through those. But if you have uh, if you want to do Q and a next, I'm more than happy to jump into that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's open up for Q and a. I'd love to. All right. So the question that we have right now, if um, stays as is we have one right now, but it was, more around the timeline from filing to receiving a rebate, or does it kind of vary by the state? Oh yeah, well I could speak, yes it varies by state, it varies by utility, it might vary by project. I have tracked that in great detail, just based on my own experience, about 80 grow lamp projects. It's typically about 30 days to get approved by a utility, about four weeks, and then you install the lights. And that depends on you, the grower, and and your construction timeline. I've seen them installed in as quick as a week. I've had others take 16 months, which has nothing, you know, because that's just, maybe they're waiting for their new transformer or some investor relations delay things. So that part is out of the control of the, the rebate process. Um, but once the lights are installed, utilities will come out and inspect, usually in person these days, uh, virtual inspections are, are a wonderful thing to keep things moving. And then it'll just go to accounts payable. And that's typically another four to six week wait. So if, there, if there's no install delay, so let's call it four weeks for approval and six weeks to get the check, about 10 weeks, about two and a half months is how long it typically takes to get that incentive check in your hand. And it's Perfect. really important to keep that in mind from a cash flow standpoint. Yep, awesome, thank you. Uh, next, we actually have a couple more flowing in. So we have one from uh, Daniel, he says, the 179D is a federal incentive, not local utility, correct? Yeah, 179D, not an accountant. Um, they, yeah, that's, that's a, it's a tax credit. It's a tax credit associated with, associated with in, uh, investments in energy efficiency in a building. So if you take an old building and put new windows on there, you can get a tax credit. That's on your federal tax return. It's from the IRS. Um, and again, check with your accountant, of course, I would argue that these type of efficiency investments would count as, uh, an investment tax credit. It, the, you might, you might, I haven't heard of anyone doing that successfully. Um, and it might bring up the question of whether or not this is part of the building or if it's just an appliance within the building or a fixture within the building. But yeah, simplest answer is yes, that's a federal thing. Uh, and, and states or utilities don't get involved in that one. Perfect. Uh, we have another one. Uh, what type of program exists in Quebec and has, what has been your experience with Hydro Quebec? So Hydro Quebec, uh, they, have a, they have a good program. They actually have a prescriptive program, which is unique. And off the cuff or from memory, uh, they have different, different bins, I think four bins. Based on the micromole output of your fixture, they'll give you, I'll make it up, 50, 100, 150, or 200 dollars per fixture. So if it's a higher wattage, you know, 800 watt LED that's putting out 2,000 micromoles, you might get 200 dollars off. That might be. It might go up to 400 dollars. I'm, 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 I'm shooting from the hip here. But yeah, it's a prescriptive thing, and you can actually find it for, uh, online. Um, so they're good. They're forward looking. 
They also have custom avenues as well. And I have not completed the project in Hydro-Quebec, but I've inquired. Um, their custom route seems uh, to be generous as well. That I think you get 30% off, you know, maybe 40%, but I'm gonna say that's a healthy program up there. Perfect. Um, another one is how often do you see need for inspection for large projects from utilities? <laughs> Good question. Um, if, you're a, if you're a pizza parlor doing a lighting retrofit, utilities generally audit 5% random sample. If you're a cannabis grower, utilities generally will audit 100% of the projects beforehand and 100% of the projects afterwards. And that's twofold. One, these are large incentives. $100,000 has been like the average incentive that we've landed. Um, but two, everything is under a microscope. And some of the savings are so big. You know, when you're saving millions of kilowatt hours, the utility wants to lay their eyes on it to make sure everything is as you would expect. Or, you know, the energy savings are credible. So I would expect 100% of these incentives to be uh, inspected before and afterwards. Awesome. Okay, if we are building in phases, is it best to submit for incentive money for the project in its entirety or should we apply per phase? Phases may be spaced out by six to 12 months. That's a great question. In general, I would say apply all at once, but I would apply for the phases separately. So I, I would submit a triplicate applications and here's phase one, two, and three um, because utilities generally like to close out a project that's approved for that budget amount. Uh, so like to open up phase one and close it. There are some utilities I've worked with who are super flexible and they say, you know what, we're gonna approve you for the half million dollars and you can just go at it bit by bit over the next three years and we don't mind. Um, so th that's where, you know, working with an energy analyst who can call the utility and have that conversation, you know, and think that far ahead. Uh, that's a really good planning question. Um, in general, apply all at once. Let me, let me back up and say, it's good to apply at once because uh, reservation of funds is a big thing. Utilities will over sometimes come October, you'll get these notices, such and such utilities oversubscribed for the year. So they're not taking applications till January. You want to get in queue for that. And, but also utilities, once you get approved, they will often have time sensitive approvals. You know, you're approved for 12 months. So if you don't think you're going to be closing this one out within 12 months, it might pay to wait. In any case, like good project management, yeah, map, map it all out. Uh, I think I answered that. Um, I don't want to Perfect. Be yeah. yeah. Um, how about BC Hydro? We have not seen a program yet. Yeah. Sorry. Um, BC Hydro doesn't like LEDs. I hate to say it. <laughs> I have tried to get incentives with BC Hydro and they have not yet budged. Uh, it's kind of a point of frustration. Okay. Um, here's one. I think it's kind of a just to confirm his statement, but hi, Bob, a great presentation. As I understand the process, a greenhouse customer usually cannot issue a purchase order to a lighting vendor before pre-approval. Once pre-approved, the process is order the equipment, installation, and then final approval and rebate payment after final approval. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's an interesting thing because you'll want, but before you apply for incentives, you want to have, you know, a strong, interest in the project because there's a lot of effort and sometimes cost associated with applying. You don't want to waste the utilities time. Um, but on that same note, you don't want to sign the purchase orders. This is frustrating, you know, for a salesperson selling lights, you don't want to sign the purchase orders or take a deposit before that incentive gets approved either. So there's kind of this handshake period where you say, Hey, once we're approved, I'm going forward with this, but uh, you kind of just have to sit on your hands um, in, until you actually sign and do that. So yeah, you, you, that, that sounded correct to me. Perfect. Um, well, last chance for questions. Anyone else got any more? If so, enter them in now. If not, we'll talk about webinar number two and sign off. Anyone type in? No? I think we might be good. If one flows in, I'll let you know. But um, you can go ahead and talk about webinar two sure. and what, what the people can expect. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, oops. Uh, next time, webinar two, two weeks from now, Friday, May 29th, uh, the time will be announced, possibly noon Pacific as well. We'll continue the conversation and talk more about some of the process pitfalls and surprises. Like I said, a little bit more about how cal uh, incentives are calculated. 
you know, in per kilowatt hour per or per kilowatt, and some of the feedback loops that you might hear about, you know, buyback periods that you have to fall within. Some of the more nuanced analysis there. Um, oh man, I keep clicking on the screen uh, prematurely. Um, and and we'll get more into the timeline of it as well. It, it'll be just more detail on some of these these great questions about all that. And all this is really to set expectations and ensure the customer success, um, which is going to be handled on a project by pro as much as we try to paint a picture of how this works. At the end of the day, it's all a project by project basis. But we'll we'll share some more stories, hopefully some success stories, not all horror stories. And um, yeah, I, I think that's about it. Just more more of this detail on, on May 29th. Well, thank you, Bob. And um, as I said before, I'll be sending out more um, uh, emails to all of you about how you sign up for the next webinar uh, in the coming week. And um, look forward to seeing you guys all there. And thank you for the attendance and participation. Um, it was very successful.